Civil War in Northern Ireland, Internment, Part 4. My training as a combat medic with 23rd Parachute Field Ambulance was very basic. Things haven't improved, hadn't improved much since the Second World War in the training. The only good training I received was when I was sent to uh, the Southern General Hospital in Glasgow. And uh, while I was there, we had the Ibrox disaster. So if anybody remembers that, uh, I think uh, 2nd of January 1971, 66 dead and over 200 injured. And I worked in the Southern General Hospital at that time for a month's uh, training. A lot of training that. It helped me a lot during this disaster on the day of internment. Okay, the first casualty I received was a paratrooper who with uh, the observation post he was in collapsed due to the nail bombs and stones. So he came into me with uh, injuries, uh, not severe, just uh, spraying and uh, bruising. After I'd been shot at, uh, I kept in the Henry Tag at all. There was a radio which everybody was communicating with. All the other observation posts and a couple of officers were talking on the radio. The, the night was developing into a uh, bonfire night, Guy Fawkes. The amount of uh, bang, bang. Now, I think uh, as, a, as I like classical music, I think uh, the 1812 would have been very suited to that evening. The IRA had not gone on holiday. What everybody is stating that there was no shooting. Obviously, somebody was shooting. So uh, there was a platoon now down in the uh, Henry Taggart Hall. Uh, the platoon commander was Lieutenant Easton. Everybody was sitting on the floor for safety because it was uh, the wall, brick wall around the Henry Taggart Hall, then wood. So everybody was sitting on the floor watching television. So we're just listening to the radio and uh, the information passed to the officers at the headquarters up in uh, Via Foster School. The front gate uh, had an observation post and they were doing most of the uh, talking on the net. Uh, even with this large amount of shooting going on, there was a large crowd gathering in front of his position on wasteland down at the bottom of Springfield Road. He noticed uh, men carrying a stretcher. He noticed the priest, Mr. Mott, uh, Padre Mullen, and observed the adults gathering, no children, just adults gathering at the field. There was nobody innocent. Who, who's on the street when there's a lot of gunfire going on? Maybe you're innocent. Fuck off home, quick. You might get shot. So, w would you be hanging around? In a, like, you know, when there's gun gunshots going off? So, I couldn't understand. But this group was under observation. Then, under fire at the uh, front gate, this group started running towards the front gate. The paratroopers that were in it, only 18, 19 years old, only young lads, they were panicking. They were being attacked. They're coming to get with. They were crying for help, you know. Well, can, we, can we fire? Can we fire? They, they were desperate. Only at this stage did Jenkins authorize the use of fire. Uh, Lieutenant Easton went out with a patrol, seven, and eight, seven or eight lads. He shouted a couple of times and then allowed his men open fire. It stopped the attack on the ob observation post at the, go at the gate of the Henry Taggart Hall. People got shot. There was dead and dying and that's on that waste ground, no doubt about it. So Lieutenant Easton came back in with his patrol and went up to report to Major Jenkins. Uh, 
The attack had stopped, but the firing continued. A fighting patrol, two armoured cars, went out and collected the wounded. Yes, they were thrown into the back of uh, armoured armor vehicles. Nobody's hanging about when there's gunfire going on. So they were physically picked up and thrown into the back of the armoured vehicle and brought in to me. Now I was with Padre Weston, who was the Roman Catholic priest for two para. We, he worked with me. We, I, I classified the, the wounded. The, the first ones I looked at, there was one old man, he was shot in the upper right arm. N not a li life threatening injury. And he says, I wasn't with them idiots. I was going to work and he had his bait box. He showed me his bait box in his hand. A bait box is a lunch box. You know, Jordy called it bait box. So he showed his, so the guy was totally innocent. He was going to work and got caught in the crossfire. So that, that was the first guy. The, ne the next guy was a young guy, I'd say 21, 22, something like that. Uh, maybe Frank Quinn, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, he was shot through the neck. Bullet had gone inside and outside. Uh, the round and the hole didn't look like a 7.62. I, I think the 7.62 SLR would have done a hell of a lot more damage. He was speaking to me and I'm saying to him, you all right? He says, yeah, I feel okay. And I says, uh, you breathing all right? And I checked his pulse and it was still strong. And I says, look, I'm a first aid. I, I don't, you need a doctor. And I, I can't help you much. I, the only thing I can think of is I lie on the bed and I put you up in a sitting position and just don't move your head. So he agreed with me, so I left him in that position. I went into the next room, and there in the next room, oh, oh my God, there was uh, Dan, Daniel Tagge. I found 12 bullet holes in him, but apparently there was more. I missed a couple, sorry. The, the main problem he had was he'd been shot in the chest, and his lungs were out his back. And they were going like that sucking noise. And I says to the Padre West, I says, look, you're going to need to help me. So I took the shell dressing. The covering of a shell dressing was waterproof. It was a, like a material that had been treated. It was waterproof. So I says to Padre West, what we'll do, we'll push the lungs back in now. If you hold the, dress, the, the, the covering of the, the, the field dressing against the holes, I'll put a tight bandage around his chest so that it'll help his breathing. So Padre Weston helped me put the bandages on around his chest. As soon as I'd done that, and we sat him up. I mean, he wasn't unconscious. He, he was totally conscious at the time. Uh, we, I sat him up and his breathing uh, was a lot better. His chest was going all right, obviously. Fucking hell, he was in a hell of a state. Then I looked at some of the gunshot wounds in his legs and arms. He says he'd been behind a tree. And that's why most of the bullets went in his arms and legs because the tree wasn't big enough. But uh, I put bandages around every hole I could find. And then uh, I couldn't do any more for him. He needed a hospital and a hospital fast. The next guy, uh, I think... Uh, Joseph Murphy. Joseph Murphy, had, while I was treating Taggart, three paratroopers were putting a shell dressing around his bullet wound in his thigh. I trained a, a group of paratroopers in first aid and they, they helped me. They, they were good lads. They did their best. But when I went and checked the dressing, it was so tight, too tight. But I, I think that was due to the heavy loss of uh, internal bleeding. External wise, there was very little, if anything, coming out of the wound, but obviously had the internal bleeding. And I had been told that I was not allowed to put on a tourniquet. And this shell dressing was acting like a tourniquet. So I released the tourniquet. 
thinking back, had my training been better, I don't think I'd released that. Okay, he'd have lost his leg, but he wouldn't have lost his life. And later on, he did take his leg off, apparently, from what I hear from his uh, daughter, Janet. When I released that bandage, he had a surge of blood go down into his leg, and he went unconscious. Uh, I uh, applied pressure to his femoral artery. Hard pressure. I kept that femoral artery closed. The bruising was caused by me. People are stating that he was tortured and he had loads of bruising around his groin. Of course he had fucking bruising around his arm. What do you think I'm doing? I'm doing this. Stopping the bleeding. Uh, uh, with, with the uh, shell dressing, that had also caused uh, bruising all over around his uh, thigh. So I did what I could for him. Uh, he went unconscious and I thought he was dead. I mean, see, I looked at his eyes, I couldn't get a flicker out of his eyes. I felt his pulse and I couldn't feel his pulse. Mm. I considered he was dead. I, I wasn't a doctor. I wasn't a doctor. And only a doctor can say he's dead or not. But in my opinion, he died. That's what I thought. Apparently, the, uh, when the doctor arrived at the Henry Tiger Hall, uh, he, he revived him. So, uh, but initially I thought he was dead. At this stage, I got told on the radio a report to the uh, Henry, the Via Foster School, a soldier had been shot. So, and also uh, a Corporal Fraser was brought in on an armoured uh, vehicle to assist me. And he was 23rd Parachute Fellow Ambulance also. So, me and him, there was a hundred yard path up from the Henry Taggart Hall to the Via Foster School. And only I had a 9mm pistol. So, I say to him, here's my pistol. It's pointless both of us getting shot. I'll make a run for the Via Foster School. You cover me and go back. Once I'm up there, go back and treat the wounded in the Henry Taggart Hall. So, that was the agreement. I did that hundred yards uphill in Olympic time. I assure you. Uh, I was panting when I got the top, but I ran fast. I got into the school and uh, Major Jenkins says, there's a wounded soldier there. I looked at the wound and he had an entry wound into his uh, right upper arm. It wasn't a bullet wound, it was shrapnel. Shrapnel? I mean, say, how could it be shrapnel? It had to come from an RPG or something like that. An RPG self-explodes at 800 meters. And it's possible the shrapnel came from that. Shrapnel don't come from a bullet, you know what I mean? So, but anyway, I treated the soldier. I put his shell dressing on the wound. I put him in a sling. I put another dressing round so he couldn't move his arm. I gave him morphine, wrote morphine on the top of his head. And I got two lads to monitor his uh, pulse every 10 minutes and I says if it gets very fast show for me again. I then reported the situation in the Henry Taggart Hall to Major Jenkins and says look sir why is there no ambulances we need to get these guys out they're all going to die if you don't get them out. He says I've been trying to get ambulances. Ambulances came from the general hospital and turned back. They said they came under fire. So the IRA stopped the ambulances. These people were dying, not because of the army not giving treatment, because the, the ambulances turned around and went back. This needs to be in, investigated in an inquiry, for sure. Why the ambulances turned around and didn't come in to help me. Corporal Fraser was down the bottom helping, and then the, uh, the Padre, Padre Weston, came running into me while I was still looking after uh, Daniel Taggart, he says, Nigel, the lad that shot in the neck stopped breathing. I think he's dead. So I looked at him, he, his eyes and pupils were pretty wide. He looked dead. But I did my best. I dragged him off the bed, I put him on the floor and gave uh, mouth to mouth and uh, tried to resuscitate him. I worked on him for about 10 minutes and uh, 
Badger Western says, Nigel, he's gone, mate. So I stopped working. And two of the lads made comments to me. They said, Nigel, if you do that for an enemy, you're one hell of a guy. And that was the best compliment anybody's ever made for me. I really appreciate that. I did my best for all them wounded, both paratroopers and <clears throat> another fighting patrol went out, and this time they found the body of John Connolly. John was brought into me. Two of the two, two of our wounds were fatal. There was no doubt about it. She'd been shot in the thumb, just there in the thumb. Obviously, I didn't kill her, but a bullet had hit her in the face. And the whole side of her face and up to the ear was gone. You could see the brain, everything. It was a fucking horrific uh, wound. Uh, rigor mortis had set in. Dew was on her body. It was like a horror film. Crazy. I, I still remember it to this day. Jesus. It was horrific. Her thigh, she'd been shot in the back of the thigh. The whole thigh muscle was on a calf, the whole lot. There was no artery or veins, it was all gone. The, just the bone I could see. Uh, both them wounds killed her. She was not out there on the, on the ground shouting for help. She had no mouth. Uh, the, the bullet wound in the thigh, she would have lasted two or three minutes. The, the femoral artery had gone. I mean, see, I've seen, heard so many stories about what happened to these people, but obviously I couldn't do nothing. She was dead. Uh, photographs were taken of her wounds. Uh, Dr. McCray, when he come in, uh, he, he authorized the taking of photographs of the wounds. He then put everybody in an ambulance. Normally only two people fit in ambulance. That would be on the floor and everywhere. The armored ambulance came in, and as soon as he got them in, he was working on them straight away and took them to the general hospital in Belfast. So everybody did their utmost to help the wounded. I don't care what anybody says. I will take a lie detector test. Put Jerry Adams on the same test that... The IRA had gone on holiday that day and nobody was shooting. What a load of balls. Can anybody believe that the IRA didn't at fire on the camp? Crazy. Uh, I'd like you all to watch these programs uh, that uh, talk about the day of internment. This is my version of what I witnessed, what I did. I was there, not second-hand information. I was there, okay? Uh, one para came in at the break of dawn and took out the barricades. They broke down the barricades and apparently they killed a couple of people. The uh, justified, shouldn't have had a barricade, eh? This was an armed, Civil war. Force was used. And had it been any other army, there'd have been a lot more dead. Jenkins was very controlled in what he did. He never allowed anybody to fire until the observation post was about to be taken. That's the only time he authorized anybody to fire. People found from other positions, Martin, uh, Martin Estate and things like that. I don't know. Nobody could see that from our position. Uh, I saw a hell of a lot of tracer. We did not have tracer. We did not have uh, sniper rifles. We didn't have CS gas. So a lot of what you hear in these documentaries about the Bally Murphy massacre is totally fabricated. And Jerry Adams is the biggest fucking liar in the world. He's the only one that doesn't know he was head of the IRA. Anyway, that is the end of the day of internment. Sad. But then people died fighting 
for a united Ireland. And instead of uh, Judas trying to take money, like uh, Jerry Adams took the money and uh, give information on IRA men that didn't were against him, he was MI5, MI5 informant. All the rest since the bloody Sunday went against the army and the paratroopers. Everybody's on the bandwagon. Money, money, money. And that's what is pushing this Bally Murphy massacre, which there was no massacre. And that is my honest opinion. Everybody was well treated and looked after. The people that caused the massacre, if there was, if you want to call it a massacre, was the IRA not allowing their ambulance to sit. And if there's an inquiry, the IRA was to be held account. And instead of the British paying compensation, the IRA should pay compensation to all those that were shot on that day. Thank you for listening. I missed out two things. And to show I'm honest, I'm going to tell the truth. An officer, I hadn't seen this officer before. He was wearing a parachute regiment uh, uniform, but I didn't know the officer. And he came to me and he asked me if I'd put ammunition in the pockets of the wounded. I said, no way. No way. Because I'd taken off all the clothes, uh, all, all the wounded were down to the underpants so I could find the bloody bullet holes. But he wanted me to plant ammunition on. And I says, no. I says, you should get the police to come out and do forensic evidence in the field, in the area, to pick up cases in that way. Oh, the police won't come out. C C C H. Cowardly, corrupt, Catholic hating policemen. Never did I see them come into Bally Murphy to assist in deaths of the army, civilians, or IRA. Never took forensic evidence. The only time I did see them in Bally Murphy was when they were selling stolen uh, clothing and other items from shops. Corrupt. And Later on, in an SPG patrol with the police, uh, they stopped women, prostitutes. They took money, and the officers, soldiers, a free ride. That was the police in Northern Ireland. So who is investigating the police? Remember the six policemen that shot four unarmed IRA men in a car? Who investigated that? What happened to them? I know. I met one in Tenerife. They were put on sick leave for the rest of their life. But paratroopers, they're trying to prosecute. But nobody is trying to prosecute police or politicians or officers. Only low level paratroopers. Politicians authorized the murder of by SES and my next video is going to be about that and blow the lid of politicians and officers because I am very angry that they're only going after low-level paratroops please watch my next videos uh, I think I covered it all now Oh, one thing. Daniel Taggart's wife came in to me the next day and she asked me, did I find in his pockets a book? I said, well, what do you mean a book? Oh, his family allowance book. Now, I'm expecting her to ask how he died. Didn't ask nothing. Just wanted the family allowance book 
which got our social security. I never heard anybody singing and doing anything nasty to that woman. So again, there's two sides to every story.